Steve Goldman. I'm the director of the Center for Free Enterprise. I want to welcome everybody here today. This is our second event of the Menard Family Lecture Series. Our final event will be on um, November 8th. It's a Wednesday at 4.30 here in the auditorium. We're going to bring in Will Scott. He's an ex U of L basketball player, undergrad, college of business student, and an MBA alum. And he's going to talk about life on Wall Street and how to build your career with your college of business degree. So if you're not getting a college of business degree, you should probably switch your major if this is the time to do it. <laughs> and uh, finance is a good area, economics is even better, and all the other areas are really good too, so I'm not slamming any of them. So pick a major. Anyhow, on a quick note, if you're here for uh, class credit, reading group participation, call no flight program, we will have QR codes on the doors as you walk out. You can take a picture of those, fill out the survey, make sure you put your name on it and why you are here so you can get credit when credit is due. And if you're not here for credit, you can still fill out the survey because we have some questions and any information you give us is very useful. So, thank you. So we're fortunate to live in a country that allows, to a great extent at least, for free enterprise. And as a result, we have, um, we enjoy a lot more leisure, we have greater income than any time in the past, and all the gadgets and time-saving conveniences that you have are a result of this free enterprise system. So we're fortunate to have all these things. And so for, for today's talk, I'm happy to have Jason Brennan. Jason is the Robert J. and Elizabeth Flanagan Family Professor of Strategy, Economics, Ethics, and Public Policy at the McDonald School of Business, Georgetown University. He specializes in politics, philosophy, and economics. He's the author of 16 books and many journal articles. And today he's going to talk about why it's okay to want to be rich. So listen up and learn something. So Jason, thanks for coming. Thanks. Thank you. All right, thanks for having me. Uh, oh, I'm gonna be really loud. Uh, Thanks for having me out here. I want to tell you a little bit about why this book series exists in the first place. Rutledge decided a while back that, you know, philosophers like me tend to be finger-wagging moralizers. We're always like, hey, the ordinary things you do are bad. They thought, what if there were a book series where people defend common sense behaviors, the way that people, normal people actually live, rather than doing the highfalutin stuff that philosophers say and themselves don't live up to. So the, the, Rutledge came to me and said, like, well, what would you want to do in a book series like that? And I'm like, you know what? I want to talk about money. And maybe personally, it's because I think I'm a little bit more money-driven than a lot of other philosophers are. Like, for instance, one of the reasons why I decided to work in a business school in the first place, I mean, I love being there. I'm glad to be there. But when they made me the offer, it was because they paid twice as much as my previous employer. Right? Should I feel guilty about that? You know, like, how, do I really need that many more guitars? Like, I don't know, right? So should I feel bad about that? And then I realized that this kind of attitude, like, I want money, but I kind of feel bad about it, is kind of common. So I think when you look at America in general, Americans have a kind of split personality when it comes to money, right? On one hand, most of us want more money, not less. If you won the lottery today, I doubt you'd be like, ugh, this will corrupt me and throw up the ticket. I bet you would cash that ticket in and buy yourself something nice. But we kind of feel guilty about that. Most of us pursue luxuries, but we also feel that crass materialism is, well, crass. We love rags to riches stories, but we also love stories about rich people getting torn down. And we like stories about peasants being happy. We spend a lot of time paying attention to what rich people do, like Elon Musk or the Kardashians, but we also kind of think that there's something base and weird about that. When Gordon Gekko, back in the 1980s movie, uh, says, greed is good, greed works, we nod in our heads in approval. And then when they haul that greedy bastard off to jail, we clap, right? So which way should we think? Well, throughout history, Lots of people have wagged their finger at money, and they basically say three things. It's wrong to want more money. It's wrong to make money. And when you do get money, the best thing you can do is give it away to, I have a list of causes right here that you can donate them to, like my history department or something. You give it to us, right? The best thing you can do with that money once you have it is to give it away. In fact, it's very common in business schools for them to teach the ethics of markets as being something, social responsibility of business just means when you make a profit, you have to give 5% of it to whatever the dean is into this year, and then you'll be fine, right? I don't think that's quite right. So I want to defend three other views about money. It's okay to want to have more money. You should want money. Money deserves your wanting of it, 
right? If money is bad for you, it's you. You're the problem, not the money. It's okay to make money if you make it the right way, and it, most of us are making it the right way. Not everybody, the English department is not making it the right way. I actually, I actually literally mean, I have a book on that very point. I literally mean that. Uh, and we could, if we have time, I'll tell you why. But, uh, but most of us, like typical motorcycle mechanic, is doing a lot of good for society and deserves the money that they're making. Not the English department, but definitely the motorcycle mechanics. And yes, it is good to give some of your money away to worthy causes. I do that. I think you should too. But you're not in perpetual debt to the rest of the world where you have to feel guilty for living high even while others don't live quite as well as you. All right, so that's why I want to defend in 36 minutes and 43 seconds those three claims. Now, who cares? Why should you care about this? Well, here's why. Because you're rich. When I'm talking about rich people, I'm not just talking about Oprah Winfrey or Elon Musk or Dr. Dre or like other people. I'm talking about you. You're the rich. If you're making GDP per capita worldwide right now is about $16,500. If you are living at the poverty line in the United States, once you account for the cost of living, you're still in the top 20 to 25% of people in the world right now, and you're in the top 1% of people who have ever lived. You are the rich. Years ago, I was teaching at another university, and we're talking about this idea of giving away your money, and some kid raised his hand and said, soak the rich, man. And I'm like, the median household income of the freshman class this year is $270,000. He's talking about you. You're the rich. Even if you're not making that much, you're still much better off than a lot of other people. Should you feel guilty about that? Should you be donating most of your extra income to charity? You know, make sure you don't have an Xbox and give the money to feed the starving. Should you do that? Are you obligated to? All right, so let's talk about wanting money. Once upon a time, a rich person by the name of Robert Kennedy, when he was pursuing as much power as he possibly could get for himself, was said, the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It doesn't include the beauty of our poetry, the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of the public debate, the integrity of public officials like him. It measures neither wit nor courage, wisdom nor learning, compassion nor devotion. It measures everything in short, but that which is worthwhile. Now, this is not a, a greatest critique of GDP because the guy who came up with this concept, Kuznets, said exactly the same thing. Not as poetically, but he said the same thing when he came up with it. But he's right. GDP and wealth, these are not measures directly of these kinds of things. So why should we care about them? Why do economists get so worked up about money and wealth and income and so on? Let me give you some reasons why. I have here a chart looking at the United States in different years and looking how people are living. In the year 1870, the United States is the third richest country in the world in per capita income and the third richest country in the world that has ever existed in all of human history. Nevertheless, the typical person would start working full time at age 13. They'd on average work about 43 and a half years. Uh, their life expectancy at birth was about 43 and a half years. They would work on average about 5,000 hours and some mix on for money and some mix at home and chores. And they typically wouldn't retire. You would just work until you couldn't work anymore and then you'd die. That's the third richest country ever to exist. Fast forward to say the year 2007, people don't start working until they're over age 20. They work far fewer hours. And this works out to be something like this. Nowadays, people like us can expect to spend only a, like less than a third of our lives awake and working. We have literally hundreds of thousands of hours more leisure time than our counterparts did a little bit more than 100 years ago. That's pretty impressive. So one of the things money is buying for us is leisure and time to play Xbox, to play piano, to uh, like learn other things, learn a foreign language, to go around the world and so on. What might money be doing for us? Well, there's a famous song that says, you can't buy me love. It's true, you can't go to the store and buy it directly. But it turns out that money helps with a lot of the stuff that really matters. And one reason for this is if you've ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which you probably have in another class, you can think of it like, when we are poor, when we are in desperate situations, we pursue the things that are most urgent. And it becomes more and more difficult to get the things that maybe matter the most. You know, when you're poor, you're worried about your physical safety. Am I going to eat tomorrow? And those kinds of things. When you have a lot of money, you're protected from these vicissitudes of life and you can worry about other stuff. You have more freedom to pursue those things. Right? So it's not to say, so one of the things money can do is perhaps not bias these things directly, but give us the opportunity to realize them. And in fact, when you look around, that's what you find. For instance, rich people tend to be happier in their marriages than poor people. The number one thing that poor people fight about in marriage is money. Right? Those things are partly connected to each other. 
right? So it's not that money can buy you love, but it can buy you the opportunity for it. It can help get you that kind of thing. Back when I was in college, you know, 20, more than 20 years ago, geez, uh, 20 something years ago, uh, I was taught that money has no major effect on happiness. Once you get about $15,000 a year in current dollars, then the total amount of money you have has no effect on how happy you are. It just plateaus. Not diminishing returns, but just straight up plateaus. No effect whatsoever. And that seemed like it was true, but the problem was the way that they collected the data to make these arguments wasn't very good. Back in 2006, a number of economists, Betsy Stevenson and Justin Wolfers in particular, got way better data, serving 130,000 people, getting a random survey from every single country. And what they found is, contrary to that, around the world, the amount of money people have is in absolute terms, not just being better off than their neighbors, the absolute level of money that people have makes them happier. The more money, the happier they are. It's a pretty strong effect. In fact, the outlier was actually the United States. The United States was a surprisingly uh, money-resistant country where Americans were actually not as affected by money as like the French. But this is a universal feature of human behavior. But it's not just that. Around the world they found things like, did you find enjoyment in the previous day? It was strongly predicted by how rich you were. Did you think that you felt loved? It was predicted by how rich you were. Did you think that you were treated with respect the previous day? People who were from rich countries said yes. People from poor places tended to say no. Did you feel anger or negative emotions? Those were correlated with being poor. So it starts to look like that story that maybe money doesn't buy you what really matters directly, but it gives you the chance to get it. It helps liberate you from the things that get in the way. It starts to look like it's true. Money literally buys us time. One of the big things is that we live a lot longer than we used to. A big part of that has to do with vaccines, of course. If you're getting childhood vaccinations, you're not dying of diseases that used to kill people. In the year 1850 in the United States, even if you were rich, you could expect on average two out of five children to die before they made it to age five. That doesn't happen very much anymore. It's not common. However, it's not just that. The second biggest predictor of how long you live has to do with the income of your country because it buys you things like nutrition and other things that make you resistant to disease. Medicine has a surprisingly weak effect on life expectancy after you get, rid of, get past the childhood vaccines. What about things like reading to your kids at night, the ritual of reading to children? Well, that's expensive. Light used to be incredibly expensive. Back in the year 500,000 BC, for you to get 1,000 lumen hours of light, which is the equivalent of burning 33 candles, like simple candles for about an hour, that much light would cost you about 65 hours of work. In the year 1800, it would cost on average about six hours of work. By the year 1890, it would cost about 10 minutes. Today, it costs, for a typical American, about 10 seconds of work. So things like having light, when the sun goes down, you can stay up. And all the stuff that you get to do is because of wealth and our access to things like light. So money, in fact, is strongly correlated with all the things that are making our lives better. What's not worth wanting about it? There's a lot to be said for it. But then people go, okay, it makes sense to want money, and lots of people do. What about making it? Isn't making it kind of a bad thing, right? And you have throughout history people saying that, you know, so Jesus says it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of the needle than for the rich man to get into heaven. It's worth noting here that uh, at the time that this was being said, we were working in a different kind of economic system. Throughout most of human history, what you have is a large number of people doing a lot of work for a small number of people who heavily exploit them and mistreat them. Some people think that's still what's going on now. Right? And the, the typical rich person is literally preying upon others. If you think about feudal, like the rich people in, say, feudal Europe, who's rich? Knights and warriors, like you guys work as peasants and the knights and warriors control you and they take all of your stuff and they're not really doing much for you back in return. Is that really what happened with, I don't know, the CEO of Apple? Is he controlling me the way that a knight is controlling me and forcing me to work? I mean, I buy Apple products, but I'm pretty sure it's not what's going on. So it might be true, but maybe the rich people today are different, right? You can think of it like this. Our intuitions evolved for certain kind of circumstances. Throughout most of human history, before civilization, we lived in small family clans of about 100 to 120 people that were characterized by heavy in-group solidarity and constant war and enmity with all the out-groups. And a lot of our moral intuitions in our brains, the architecture of our brains for ethics, was designed to help us live in that environment. What does it take for us to live in small tribes at war with other tribes successfully? That's your moral psychology. But we don't live in that kind of environment anymore. Yes, there's war, yes, there's conflict, but it's not the way it used to be. We also, for a lot of human history, lived in a feudal type system. 
right, which has a very different kind of economic interaction. So a lot of our cultural norms that have developed are for feudalism. That stuff is still with us. We don't live in these kinds of environments anymore. Now we cooperate on a massive scale. Even something like a number two pencil. How many people does it take to make a number two pencil? You're probably thinking, I don't know, a couple hundred at the factory. The answer is something like 50 million. It takes millions of people to make that thing. We cooperate on a massive scale. But our intuitions don't match this. And we tend to be very suspicious of trade. I try to disabuse my students of this by having them play a game at the beginning of every semester. It's called the candy game. I walk in and I hand every student a unique candy bar uh, just at random. I tell them they can't eat it and they can't do anything with it at first. And then I sit, have them rate it on a scale of one to 10. And then I say, for 10 minutes, I want you to make as many trades as possible with any willing partners and then come sit down. So they go and they trade the candy bars and then I ask them to rate their candy bars again on a scale of one to 10. Typically what happens is at the beginning of the game, the average score is something like a 3.5. People are pretty unhappy with their candy. By the end of the game, after 10 minutes, suddenly their scores are eight, nines, and tens, and everyone's really happy. All we did was move candy around by mutual consent, and we literally created wealth in 10 minutes. Literally created wealth without having to invent anything, just by moving it around, by mutual trade. Generally speaking, that's how trade works. Generally speaking, you buy something only because you expect a profit, and they sell it to you only because that you expect a profit. So if I think about something I bought recently, uh, it's always a guitar. I bought a Paul Reed Smith uh, hollow body piezo two uh, guitar, right? We were talking about that a second right at lunch. Yeah, I bought that. You know, it's not cheap, but like Paul Reed Smith is happy to sell it to me because they prefer having my money to having that guitar. And I'm, I didn't get suckered. It wasn't like they won. I prefer having that guitar to having the money. We both walk away happy and we shake hands and go, that was a good deal. I'm glad we made that deal. That's pretty cool. What's to complain about? Well, it turns out that it's not just these one-shot things that happen. It turns out that there's a systematic effect of having systems of people engaging in trade like this. And that systematic effect is that we're a lot better off than we would have been had we come earlier. Right? So you can kind of summarize that the economist Deirdre McCloskey has a nice summary of economic history in two sentences. She said, it goes like this. Once upon a time, everyone everywhere was poor. Then capitalism happened, and now we're rich. She means it. What does she mean when she says everyone, everyone was, everywhere is poor? Think about what you mean by extreme poverty. When I say the word extreme poverty, picture what that means to you. For almost all of human history, that's how every single human being lived. At the year 1 AD, on a high estimate, the typical person was living on about a dollar a day in current US dollars. And you're like, you can buy hardly anything with a current US dollar. You're saying like people in 1 AD were living on average about 460 to 500 dollars over the course of a year. You can't get anything with that. Yeah, that's right. They were desperately poor. And those numbers, if anything, are misleading because there was income inequality. So the kings and the high priests and the knights and stuff were living much better than everybody else. So the typical person was living much worse. That was common throughout all of human history until relatively recently. Until you get to about, you know, there'd be empires and growth and this, but it'd all be kind of small. And then starting around the year 1500 to 1600, suddenly you start having growth. It's not the same everywhere. But one thing to notice about this is it's positive growth everywhere. It's not just redistribution. It's not just Europe got rich and other places got poor, which suggests that things simply got shuffled around. Literally stuff was made to the point where the United States today, its economy by itself will produce 50% more than the entire world produced in the year 1950. Stuff has been made, not merely moved around. Almost every country today is better off than it was 50 or 60 years ago. Almost every tip person is better off than they would have been had they been born some other point in history. Even like in the United States, GDP per capita in the United States around like 1905, it's a roughly around what we now consider the poverty line. The typical person is now, in the year 1900, is what we would now call poverty. We're much better off than we used to be. Wealth has been made because of things like markets and working together. A lot of people have a kind of suspicion of profit. It's okay if you make a little bit of profit, but you make too much, something must be going wrong. Um, I actually give students a project in class where it's called the ethics project and I say to them over the course of the semester working in groups I want you to think of something good to do break up into groups and do it and then at the end of the semester you have to answer a bunch of questions about it analyzing what you did one of the things they might decide to do is run a business that's actually one of the easier projects to prove that they've added value to the world because it's actually quite simple when you think about what a market price is it's a function of supply and demand. What does that actually mean? 
How many of you have taken an econ course where you covered the idea of supply and demand? Most of you. Okay, that's good. But do you know what that really means? What does that really mean? What it means is around the world, there's a bunch of people like you who have preferences, who have knowledge, who have goals, who have trade-offs that they're willing to make, and awareness of what's happening around them. And you make decisions. And the collective effect of you making these decisions and interacting with other people are these curves that describe human behavior in the aggregate, what kinds of trade-offs people are willing to make. So that means, and market prices emerge from your collective behavior. Like that's where they come from, from your decisions and your values. All of you together working as individuals and working together lead to market prices. This tells us something about the relative value of things. And then it allows us to make decisions about how we can serve other people. So for instance, I had an idea just now. Um, I think what I'm gonna do is take that Paul Reed Smith guitar and all my other guitars, I have about $50,000 worth, and bash them into pieces and then make a sculpture of Mickey Mouse. And I'm gonna sell that on the internet. I'm going to try to charge $100,000 for it. What do you think? Do you think I'll get it? Probably not. You guys, maybe I'm really good at sculpting. You don't know. But yeah, I probably wouldn't, right? Suppose I try that. Well, if I lose a bunch of money on it, that's the market telling me you took something people valued at this much and you turned it, I'm sorry, you took something people valued this much and you turned into something they valued this much. Now you have to eat a loss. You've destroyed value from the world and you're going to suffer as a consequence. On the other hand, suppose I, I, I don't know, I'm Taylor Swift and I'm like, what if I try singing about shaking things off over a simple A minor C, G chord progression for four minutes? It turns out people really love that kind of thing. Uh, and so it costs you very little to do it and then you make billions of dollars doing that kind of thing. That's the market saying you took something that people value this much, your time, the cost of musicians, the cost of some instruments, studio time and so on, and you turn into something people value this much. You created value for the world. So what we fail to realize is that in a proper competitive market, if it, there aren't too many externalities, then the amount of profit and loss you're making is telling you what you're doing for other people. If you're making a lot of profit, that's because you're helping a lot of other people. You're doing a lot of good for others. If you're making a lot of loss, it's because you're destroying value. You're sucking it out of the universe and taking away things people value. People, on the other hand, have a kind of prejudice against this. You might have heard about studies that work like this. Uh, you, give, you give people two resumes that are otherwise identical Right? And you do this on a large scale. So I take 1,000 people over here and 1,000 people over here. The two resumes are identical, but uh, one name sounds kind of Muslim and the other name sounds kind of Christian. Right? And then what will happen is, on average, Americans will rank the Muslim-sounding resume as worse than the Christian one. Right? Have you heard of all those sort of studies? Or like, you give it like a black-sounding name like Tyrone versus like a white-sounding name like Michael, I guess. And then Americans will, on average, like low, give a lower score to the black-sounding resume. You heard of that study? Right, this has been done a bunch, okay? It turns out Americans do that same kind of thing for profit. If you go, give them an experiment, you go, here, I want to describe to you a business, um, and I, don't, I just describe what it does, and then I tell you, I tell you this business makes 10% profit. How ethical do you think it is? And I tell you, this business loses 10% per year. How ethical do you think it is? On average, you'll say that the, the business that makes more profit is less ethical, and you'll be like, it loses money? They must be really good people. Right? That's kind of our prejudice, and it's not based on anything. Right? It's just literally an assumption that we make. So I think this is the former dean of Wharton. Uh, I didn't go to Wharton, but I just like this quote. Uh, he says, at Wharton, we believe the role of business is to advance society as a whole, creating new wealth and economic opportunity for all people in developing regions as well as developing economies. When he made this statement, some people clapped, some people ignored it, and some people said, ah, oh, man, he's really taking it easy on business. Because the primary thing he's saying business is responsible for is doing business. He's saying the primary way that business makes the world better is through the business activity itself. Things like donating money to charity and other stuff, that's, that's great, but that's secondary. The main thing we do is business, right? He's like, we're taking it easy on people. I don't think we're taking it easy on people. I think that's actually something that deserves a degree of applause, right? In a way, we're kind of like, uh, let's see. In a way, as my, as my friend Chris McDonald says, in a way we're kind of mean to business, right? So he says another way of putting this idea is like, if you think, ah, oh, all business is about is donating money to charity and business is kind of sketchy and unethical, what you're basically saying to a business, let's imagine you're a business person, like, hey, you know, you made a product other people wanted at a price they could afford to pay, a product that when they bought it, they said, I've profited from this product. That's what you did. On top of it, you probably employed some people which made their lives better. On top of it, you provided an investment opportunity for other people. On top of that, let's say you followed the laws. Not every business does, but let's say you did. 
And on top of that, you pay taxes, which go to pay for other kinds of services, like roads and things like that. You know, this stuff isn't free, someone's going to pay for it. You did all that stuff. But what have you done for us lately? Seems like kind of a jerk thing to say. The reality is a typical business person is doing a lot more good for society by running their business than they are by, say, I don't know, like, pay, like voting or other kinds of things that they do. All right? They're doing good for that, and we should accept that and applaud them for it. Or we should acknowledge the contribution people make instead of just assuming that every time someone's doing business, they're doing something unethical. Of course, there are such things as unethical business. Right? There are cases where people make their money in an illegitimate way. I best I have a slide on this, so I'm going to actually tell you about the English department. Is anyone from the English department here? I'm totally willing to say this in front of me anyways. Uh, all right, so here's a question. Uh, here at this university, are you required to take a lot of uh, composition courses? Is that required? Like, you have to take like two or three composition classes, like freshman comp or intro to writing? Okay, empirically speaking, I don't know about here, could be the exception to the rule, I haven't looked, checked on this university in particular. Empirically speaking, those classes do not work. They do not make people better writers. This has been studied at great length, and they don't work. Typically, what happens when they show that they don't work is universities require you to take more of those classes. Why does that happen? That's weird. If taking a pill doesn't work, why make you take three copies of it, right? Here's what I'm explaining to you, like the background dynamics of universities. Typically speaking, at most universities, for every student that your department gets in a seat, your department gets more money. What happens, my, friend, my colleague uh, Phil Magnus and I discovered, is um, financially needy departments around the United States heavily lobby the general education committees of their schools to ensure that students are required to take classes in their departments, and then rich departments that don't need extra money don't do this. So the biggest predictor of whether you're going to have to take a gen ed in a particular department is how poor that department is and how bad their job market is. Oops. So that's when I say, like, English departments, <laughs> yeah. So when I said, like, you know, not everyone makes their money ethically. You know, the English department doesn't make its money ethically. But then others do. Like, take the company Mesa Boogie. I'm picking them because I, I love Mesa Boogie. I have a bunch of Mesa Boogie amplifiers. You know, what did that company do? There was a piano player who said, I think I can make a better guitar amp than other people did and invented a new style of distortion, which is so popular that even if you're not into rock music or something, you've heard thousands of songs with, these album, with this stuff on it, right? Anyone ever hear a song by Prince? Right, this stuff. Anyone hear Metallica? Santana? Rolling Stones? Mesa Boogie, thank them, right? If you like that stuff, thank them. They came up with that sound, right? They made products other people, they innovated, they made products other people want, and they make other people's lives better, especially mine, because I'm a guitar player and I love them. All right. So now people might say, well, what about the fact that some nations are rich and some are poor? Isn't the explanation for why some countries are rich and some countries poor because some countries stole from the others? It is true, historically speaking, that some countries stole from others. It's really horrible that this happened. I'm not going to excuse that for one second. It's not what I'm here to do. However, when the NAACP says a mind is a terrible thing to waste, they're actually right. And it's a measurable thing. In fact, a paper just came out a week ago on this very point about how emancipating African Americans from slavery caused a massive economic boost to the country because it wasn't a very useful thing to do with people to like, keep them in bondage. They did better stuff afterwards. So the economics started, and like modern economics started with Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. If you haven't ever read that whole book, it's a long book, but you should. Book four of the Wealth of Nations is actually a critique of imperialism. Adam Smith is a professor of moral philosophy. He thinks imperialism is unethical for a variety of reasons. But he says, look, I'm not going to convince, say, the British or the Spanish of this because they don't really sympathize with others all that much. What, can I, what have I proved to them that their empire isn't actually making them rich? So he scrupulously measures how much stuff is England getting from its empire. It's like exploiting all these other countries and taking their stuff. How much is it getting? What's the economic value of all the stuff that it's stealing? Okay, how much does it cost to steal that stuff? And it turns out, it works out to be something like this. For every pound, or let's say dollar, for every dollar of stuff that it steals, it's spending $2 stealing it. It'd be like if I came in here and robbed you right now, and I walk up with $50,000, but my revolver cost me $100,000. I've actually lost money. It's still horrible, and you're a victim, and I'm wrongdoing, but I'm actually losing money. So he says, why would they do this? He, and he says the Spanish, that Spain's the same thing. It turns out, by the way, he's right about this. So you can read the book, Man in the Pursuit of Empire. We have much better data on this point than Adam Smith does, and it checks out. He says, why does this happen then? If they're losing money on their empire, why would all these empires exist? He's like, oh, it works something like this. 
I'm the, let's say, I'm the king and you are the minister who's in charge of warships and you build warships and uh, you guys get, let's say, monopolies on trade, right? Well, we, who are politically connected, make a lot of money on the empire, but the money, empire costs money in the form of taxes. Well, we won't pay it, we'll make them pay it. Concentrated benefits, diffused costs. That's how empires work. So he actually is arguing, he says, England has the illusion that it has a gold mine on the other side of the Atlantic, but it doesn't. That's one of the reasons he's like, with the Americans want to, like the American colonists want to go, we should let them. Not only because it's unethical, but like we're not even making money on them. All right, so I think the story that a lot of people think, tell, which is like, oh, well, all that happened in the last 500 years is that some countries took advantage of other countries. If that were true, what you'd expect to see is wealth going like this. In fact, wealth went like that. Right? And part of the reason for that is because empires actually don't pay for themselves. They're not actually a gold mine. So that's not to say that imperialism was, I'm not excusing, it, it's a horrible thing, but it's not the reason why countries are rich today. In fact, empires almost always lose money. So now we're talking about, so money is good, and money is, can be made ethically. The English department doesn't do it, but a lot of businesses do. All right, so what should we say about keeping it? Now that we have it, should we feel bad about having it? I want to point out that you are all living high while people die. Like, for instance, not to pick on you in particular, but I can just see, you have a MacBook Pro there, right, with a, with a hard screen, like the hard case, right? Uh, do you need a MacBook in order to do video editing? With a red shirt, I'm sorry, I'm pointing at you, I don't know your name. Uh, well, you, you do too, I'm, I'm just pointing the person behind you, but you also, so since you're not, I'll point you. Do you need it to do video editing? Do you do software editing? Do you do uh, music editing? Do you just kind of write papers and stuff? Yeah. So you could have a Chromebook, and it would do everything that you need a computer to do, probably, like 250 bucks. So there's like $1,500 there that you didn't really need. And for that, for about 50 bucks, you can cure a person of blindness from trachoma if you give it to sight savers. So basically, there's 30 people that are still blind because you didn't help them. <laughs> All right? Not you in particular. I wasn't even pointing at you. I was pointing at her. So you too. I was actually had you in mind at first. I always spoke to the person with the Mac. But that's true of almost everything. Like, I look around the room. I see like you know, uh, jackets people don't really need, you could dress less, you could have let fewer clothes, stop taking vacations, you know, like live in like smaller places. It's true, we're all living high while people die. Me too, right? We're all living high while people, I didn't have to buy that guitar, right? We were talking about guitars at lunch. I didn't have to buy that for 1500, it was about, what was it, $1,800 or $1,600? So yeah, I also could have like saved a bunch of people from blindness, from trachoma, and I didn't. I saved some, but not everyone I could. Should we feel bad about that? The philosopher Peter Singer says, yeah, you should. Here's his argument. He says, he thinks, he thinks you agree. He goes, imagine you're walking, like say across campus, and as you're walking across campus, you see a toddler drowning in a pool of water. In order for you to rescue this toddler, you need to jump in right now. You don't have time to take off your brand new blue suede shoes that cost 500 bucks. So you have to just jump in, they'll get muddy and be destroyed. According to you, are you obligated to jump in and save that kid? Not, is it nice for you to do, but you should do it. You'd be blameworthy not to. Who says, yes, you must save the kid? A lot of people. Okay, let's change it a little bit. You're walking across campus and you happen to be holding your cash in your hand and it's really windy and you don't have any pockets. And then the toddler is once again drowning. In order for you to save the toddler, you need to let go of the money and it's going to blow away and be gone forever. $500 lost. I don't actually have 500 bucks here, but $500 lost. Save the kid? Anyone say, nah, it's okay, let him die. <laughs> All right. Now, if you needed the money to live, if it's like, if I, if I lose this $500, my children starve to death, fine. He would agree. But we're talking about that, like just stuff you don't necessarily need, but you just want. So Singer's like, all right, well, right now, around the world, there are lots of kids who are dying of preventable causes, and you could save them by not having purchased a MacBook, by not having purchased a guitar, by not having had me come out here and give this talk and instead donating the money, by not making a donation to the University of Louisville and instead giving it to other kinds of causes, by not going on vacation this year or by taking a much cheaper vacation, by not buying as nice of a car, by not buying a new television. You could save those people and you don't. So are you a bad person? Should you feel guilty about that? Is it wrong to do? Is there any difference between just the fact that you happen to see a kid in front of you versus there's just kids out there you know about? Psychologically speaking, it seems like there's a difference. We know that when you put tragedy in front of people, they react to it. Whereas merely thinking about tragedy doesn't activate you in the same way. Empirically speaking, almost all of you would jump in and save the kid, right? The whole bystander effect thing you might have heard about in the 70s is not even true. People actually do jump in and help. 
Uh, but when you just know that there's kids out there, it doesn't activate your brain the same way, right? Like you don't feel it the way when you like see a kid starving. So does this prove that we should be giving away? He says, once you agree to that, you basically have to think of it like this. There's so many kids out there, I should just keep giving away money. Anytime I could save a life, I should give away money, right? Any kind of, do, any kind of major significance. I should constantly be saying like, all right, I'm about to spend $50 at a restaurant, but I know I could save somebody from blindness. Uh, what's more important, that I eat at this restaurant for 50 bucks or that I save a person from blindness? Well, saving a person from blindness is more important. I should give it to that. Does that really follow? Maybe it does, in which case maybe we should be giving away most of our money, but maybe not. Uh, maybe it's a little bit more complicated than Singer lets on. So one problem is something like this. If I say to you, if you encounter emergency once, are you required to jump in? You, most of you say yes. But what if I make the thought experiment more similar to the actual world? You're walking along campus one day when you see a gigantic pool of water. In that pool of water are millions of drowning children. Every time you pull a kid out, that kid will for the most part remain free. He won't fall back in. However, as you pull children out, there's constantly more kids falling in. That would be a more realistic thought. But that's actually more similar to our real world. It's not, I pull one kid out once, the problem is solved. It's, I save that one kid, and now there's a bunch of other kids also dying. Do you agree that you need to spend the rest of your life saving children, only taking breaks to sleep and eat in order, and maybe work out if you need to, to strengthen your muscles to maximize the number of children saved? No? All right, so that's basically the problem. The analogy he gives at first is... Pretty good grounds to think you should do some helping, but it doesn't follow that you have to help to the point of marginal utility. It doesn't follow that you have to spend the rest of your life helping other people. So this gets us back to a kind of common sense idea. You should give some to help others. You don't have to give it all. It's not really clear what the cutoff is. You gotta do something. You don't have to do everything. It's not really clear what the cutoff is. That's the kind of common sense morality. But it's actually more complicated than that because in fact we face, I, I, I'm making it sound like I'm taking it easy on us. But I actually think it's more complicated than that. If you want to really maximize the good that you do to others, it's not really clear donating at all is the best thing to do. For one, you could donate to lots of lousy causes. Have you guys ever heard of a, a program called Scared Straight? Uh, anyone heard of that? Scared Straight, what they do is, um, let's say that you're a 13-year-old boy who's shown some criminogenic behavior. We take you, we bring you to a prison where a bunch of people in prison right now yell at you and threaten to hurt you and say, like, when you come to prison, we're going to hurt you a bunch, and it sucks here. And then supposedly, you'll be so scared that you won't commit any crime. All right? Should you give them money? No, you shouldn't, because it turns out that the people who are selected by lottery to go to Scared Straight are much more likely to commit crime than the people who lose the lottery and don't go. So we're taking, using randomness. In fact, it's so bad that one economics paper that evaluated them said that scared straight causes $200 of social harm for every dollar you give them. It's a very bad charity. Uh, I probably hope they won't get sued for saying that, but it's out there in the literature. They didn't sue those, sue those people. They won't sue me. All right. You could give money to the English department. I wouldn't. <laughs> you know, not saying that they're the worst thing ever. They're not as bad as scared straight, but they're not great either. Right? So not every charity is worth your money, but it's not just that. It's the money that you spend on charity isn't going towards other things. Why are we so rich? Well, part of the reason we're so rich is trade, but part of it is because of capital development. People invest their money into capital. Capital makes human beings more productive. More productive human beings get paid more. The reason I have as much income as I, as I do now is in part because I just was lucky enough to be born here and not someplace poor, and lucky enough to be born now and not sometime in the past. A person like me, in my circumstances, who'd been born in the same place 100 years earlier, like I was born in Lowell, Massachusetts. If I'd been born in Lowell, Mass in like 1870 and with my circumstances, I wouldn't be a professor at Georgetown making what I make. I'd probably be like, frankly, I'd probably be a criminal, actually. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not being funny, that's probably true. Uh, it sounds funny, but it's probably true. Uh, so, like, a lot of it comes from things like capital development. We benefit from that. If you want to help other people, you actually have a real puzzle. How much money should I spend donating to effective charities? I mean, don't donate to ineffective charities or bad charities. How much should I donate to effective charities? How much should I spend on trade? 
because trade matters too. In the year 1870, sorry, in 1972, when Peter Singer's paper comes out, South Korea is a very poor country with making about $500 to $600 per year, living in a third world standard of living. Within 25 years, it becomes a first world European style country where people are much richer. Why? Because people didn't listen to Peter Singer. Singer would have said, whatever you do, don't buy Hyundais, don't buy Samsung, don't buy any kind of like VCRs and stuff from South Korea. Like that's a waste of money, but no one listened to him. And as a result, South Korea became rich. And now instead of asking how much money should we give to South Korea, we're asking how much money should South Korea give to others? So trade matters. And then there's also investment for the long term. You know, if I have $100 right now, I could invest that and feed like a few people, or if I, I'm sorry, I could, I could spend it right now and feed a couple people, or I could invest it and then 50 years from now, feed hundreds of people with that same money. You know, it'd be worth thousands of dollars at a, like a regular 7% growth rate. So should, is it better to feed a few people now or many people in the future? What if it turns out my investing, it also makes it so in the future, fewer people need to be fed in the first place. So instead of saying, oh, I'm taking it easy on us by saying, Chari you don't have to give it all to charity. I'm actually being more dramatic. I'm like, if you really want to maximize your output, there's a genuine puzzle here. It's not actually clear if you want to help people as much as possible how much you should give to effective charities, how much should be spent on trading and normal business, and how much should be spent on investment. There's actually a really difficult problem to solve here. Right? So with that, I think you know, we're short. There's more to be said. There's objections that haven't been answered. But that's my basic pitch. People think money is kind of a bad thing, even though they all want more of it. Right? In fact, to prove that, I put under each of your chairs $100 right now that you're free to do with whatever you want. No one looked. OK. Uh, so. Uh, people think it's bad to want it, they think that it's bad to make it, and they think it's bad to keep it once you make it. Though usually they add that you should give it to them and then you'll be fine. I don't think that's quite right. It's Money's worth wanting. It does a lot of good for us. We should give it credit for all the good that it does. Money can be made the right way in ways where you don't have an ethical complaint about what people did. And finally, when you have some, if you want to help other people, it's actually a genuine puzzle about what's the best way to do it, but you're not in perpetual servitude to others where you have to spend the rest of your life making up for the fact that you made money. All right, so with that, thanks for listening, and I'm happy to take your comments and questions and objections. All right, you're first, go for it. Okay, oh, um, thank you for talking, um, first of all. Um, I agreed with most of what you said. I think everyone needs to make their money and feel good and have a good life. Um, but first to conceptualize a million versus a billion. Million seconds is 12 days, billion seconds is 31 years. So, um, my, I guess, question would be, would you make the same arguments for billionaires who charter private jets multiple times a week for no reason when the people who work under them make or live paycheck to paycheck? Yeah, so one question is, if you think about, say, Jeff Bezos, right? Uh, if, if he's underpaying his workers, he's underpaying his workers, and that's a problem. But it's a problem regardless of whether he has a billion dollars or a million dollars or zero dollars or negative fifty dollars, right? If I owe you something, I owe it to you regardless of how much money I have. So I think we want to separate those two questions. If Amazon, ha if Amazon or some other billionaire that you might point to has particular business practices that are bad, those practices are bad. They're not bad because they have a billion dollars, they're just bad because they're violating an obligation. Right? Um, if I, just another example, like if I beat my children and I'm poor, that's bad. If I beat my children and I'm rich, that's bad. The problem is beating the children. Okay. Uh, but then what about, is there enough, is there ever a point where you have too much money? I mean, I do have the common sense idea that like the more you have, the more you should give to charity because the easier it is. So again, you have to give to effective charities, not just any charity. Uh, you know, and it is true that like a lot of that wealth has diminishing marginal returns, but we have to think about what that wealth is in the form of. Uh, Jeff Bezos, for instance, has a lot of money. He does not have a Scrooge McDuck money pit sitting around where he goes and swims in the cash. What he has are stock in Amazon. What he has is a claim to 
like things like this fact, like the warehouse in Sterling, Virginia near my house, right? That's where his money, his wealth is literally in the form of Amazon. What is that stuff doing? Well, frankly, and this is interesting, it does a lot more to serve you and me than it does to serve him. He eats better than I do. I don't take private charter jets. I'm sure he has a way better vacations and so on. I bet if he even plays guitar, he has better guitars than I do. I don't think he does, right? But most of his wealth is actually in the form of capital that serves us, and it serves us a lot more than it serves him. That's true of a lot of other billionaires that's just sitting there in the form of capital that's being used to pay for your student loans and start businesses or literally physical capital, like factories that are like serving us and so on. So I don't think that there's like a point where if you get too much money, suddenly it becomes evil. I don't think it gradually becomes more evil the more you have, in part because this stuff is doing these sorts of things. The other thing to note, and this sounds really mean, right? So I'm going to pick me as an example. Jeff Bezos, he's like retired now basically, but take a random day that he was working as CEO of Amazon. He would do more good for other people on that day than someone like me would do over the course of a lifetime. He really would. Like his marginal product was actually really high. And in fact, an interesting thing about CEOs uh, is that on average, they get paid less of their marginal product than the rest of us do. There's a theory in micro, you guys took micro mostly, that says that on average, Typically, on a competitive market, you get paid your marginal product of labor, meaning if you produce $100 worth of value for others, you'll get paid about $100, bucks, right? That's not always true. If you take more labor econ, you learn that there's exceptions to that. CEOs, actually, like of big corporations, actually tend to get paid significantly less than their marginal product. They'll do billions of dollars for others and only get paid, say, $20 million. They're getting a lower percentage. So, no, I mean... I don't think there's an inherent problem with billionaires. I do think when you point to particular billionaires, a lot of them are doing bad things, but the problem is the bad thing. It's not the billion dollars. If you get a billion dollars because you did something bad, that's, you shouldn't have the money perhaps, but it's not that the billion dollars is itself an inherently bad thing. Okay. Um, well, then I guess my last question would be, um, you know, you said billionaires are all good people, mostly good, or whatever. Um, what are your ideas about regulation? Because a lot of these people, you say a lot of his wealth is in stocks. He can still take out loans against those stocks. Yeah. He can still get a house under all those stocks. Um, he can put it under his business in certain ways. Would you see that as appropriate? Yeah, actually, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, because regulation is one of the problems. And this is actually my complaint about the, the English department. How does the English department make money? The technical term is rent seeking which rent seeking means you manipulate the legal environment to advantage yourself at, at the expense of your competitors and others, right? So many times when, regulation can be a good thing. Sometimes it solves problems. Regulation can also be a weapon. Another way of thinking of it is a lot of you like sports, like they take football, all right? Imagine like, uh, you know, your favorite football team is, uh, into, is really good at passing and then maybe your favorite football team is really good at rushing. Right? And now you're lobbying the NCAA, or, or, sorry, the NAAC, I'm like screaming, NCAA uh, to, um, to like change the rules to like make it easier for your team to win versus your team to win. Right? A lot of what businesses do, is, especially in DC, is lobby to change regulations for their benefit. Uh, so like, okay, like, take like Amazon and eBay and so others were pushing to create sales tax in the internet. Why would they do that? They don't want to be taxed. Ah, but our competitors would suffer more from attacks. So I think many times regulation can be a good thing, but oftentimes regulation is used as a weapon to disadvantage competitors and on behalf of you, and that's one of the ways that businesses can make business money unethically. This is kind of the problem we have. Uh, imagine a world in which there's lots of criminal gangs running the street, like roaming the street, fighting and shooting people, and we decide we want to arm the police to stop them. But it turns out that these criminal gangs, whenever we give the police weapons, they steal the weapons and then use them against the police and the rest of us. In that kind of world, every time we try to arm the police to protect ourselves, we're actually arming the people who are harming us. The problem with regulation is it often works like that too. Sometimes it's used for good. Sometimes it's actually going to be captured by the very people trying to regulate to, to hurt us for their benefit. What's the overall mix? That's a good question. But I would say it's like regulation is not inherently good. It's not inherently bad. It's kind of kind of depend on how it gets used. Great. Thank you. Hello. Um, I, first off, I would like to say that I do agree with some of the points in your book. I heavily disagree with a lot of them just off the bat. But I do agree with your main overarching idea that it should not be considered 
like bad to want to make money and to actually make money. I, I do believe there's a heavy stigma against that and that it should not be considered as like sinful as it actually is. Um, however, when I was discussing this among peers about the book, I realized that a lot of my disagreements with your points stem from the idea of you use the words poor and rich a lot. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that the definitions of those two words changes depending on who you're asking. For example, I lived most of my life below the poverty line. However, I did not consider myself poor back then because I was not homeless. And I do not consider myself rich now beyond any means, even though I am above the poverty line. So my question for you would be, what is your, in the context that you are using it in your presentation and in this book, what is your definition of poor and rich and do you believe there is a middle ground or do you believe it is simply above and below the poverty line? I mean, I don't think the, the poverty line in the U.S. is anything special. It's not like a real number that, that really signifies much, frankly, you know, give you, given the way that it's defined. So when I say almost everyone in the world was poor throughout human history, I would, I'm sort of appealing to Americans and thinking like, think of what you mean by poverty, the typical reader. Think of, or think of what the UN means by poverty. They'll say like living on a dollar a day and what little that can buy. If you don't want to call that poor, like if you, if you, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's some sort of deprivation that's material and people don't have that much. And now we have a lot more. And one of the reasons why I make this whole argument that you are rich is because I think people often don't appreciate how much they have. Right? They don't understand how much inequality there is in the world. Like how much, like, you know, a typical person in Singapore is living on like $150 per day and the typical person in like some other country might be living on like less than a dollar a day. They don't understand that. So, so they, oftentimes the people who are living in like richer countries don't realize that they're richer. They often don't realize how much richer they are than, than the people in the past. So if I say to someone in England, you, a typical English citizen today is living 40, is 40, 40, sorry, 44 times richer than the typical English citizen a thousand years ago. Now, what's the cutoff between rich and poor? I mean, at the end of the day, it's just less money, more, well, less stuff, more stuff. And, and how we're gonna use these words is gonna be kind of arbitrary. There's gonna be a point in history, if there's 1% if there's economic growth per year for the next like 100 years, then 100 years from now, the typical person worldwide is gonna be at the level of the typical person in Canada now. They're gonna consider a lot of what we do poor, right? Uh, I remember reading a biography of Thomas Cromwell where they were talking about how rich he was, and they're like, he had six shirts. Literally, I, like, I have six shirts that I've never worn, right? He had six shirts total, and he's like one of the richest people in England. So he was considered rich at the time and poor now. I completely agree with you that poverty and wealth are going to be relative terms. I am pegging this on like kind of the way that a lot of people are going to use these things. But at the end of the day, they, these are shorthands for real numbers that really mean something. And we could, every time I say rich and poor, I could just substitute in particular numbers to like make the point. All right, so I definitely don't think there's like, a point where you stop. In a way, we're all poor forever because we never get everything that we want. And, you know, in a way, we're, we're quite rich compared to most of human history because it's not expected that any of us are ever going to die from lack of money, right? Uh, and that wasn't common for most people, right? So is that the official way to define it? Absolutely not. It's a relative concept, and you're right to point that out. Yeah, thanks. Can you come closer to the mic a little bit? Uh, oh, no, he's going to fix it. Yes, thanks. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I'm very skeptical of government to government foreign aid. By the way, if I'm wrong about this, that this is not officially part of the book. So if I'm wrong in the answer to this question, the book might be fine. I'm very skeptical about government to government foreign aid for the reasons that you are. In fact, I used to teach a class on this and we would cover a lot of the research on it. Uh, government, government to government aid has all sorts of problems. It's often directed for political causes. A lot of times the money is being spent on, the point isn't really to help the people over here, it's to engage in rent seeking and pay people off over here. Uh, a lot of times foreign, government to government foreign aid has the problem of like, you know, we're basically like, you're the dictator of your people and I noticed that you guys are poor. We're gonna give you $2 billion and uh, if we come back and they're still poor a year from now, I guess we'll have to give you more. Well, what's, this, what's he gonna do? 
right? So oftentimes they take the money and shoot the freedom fighters and build a really fancy airport and don't help people. You know, turning on money in response to like deprivation doesn't necessarily have that effect. Uh, and in fact, when money, st when a lot of European countries stopped giving money to various poor countries, they got richer afterwards because a, a lot of things that can happen too is you give money to like, let's say you're the government elites of your country and you have an extractive economy and we give you money. Well, you guys fight over each other, to, amongst each other to decide who gets to have that cash. And also you have a very strong incentive to like maintain that kind of current economic system. And because you're getting money from me, you don't have as strong of an incentive to actually make their lives better. You're not serving them. You're just trying to get sure, make sure you keep getting money. So that's like those, what I just said back is like the stuff that you read. I'm repeating it because a lot of people haven't read that stuff. So for those reasons, I'm skeptical of government to government aid. That doesn't mean I'm skeptical of all donations though, right? Like the difference, there's a difference between like me giving money to site savers and the US government giving like a billion dollars to some random country. You know, targeted donations in certain cases can do a lot of good. One of, uh, one of my favorite charities um, uh, does what's called zero overhead giving. Right? It's called, a company group called Give Directly, and they'll basically walk into a very poor country with cash that people like me have given them and go up to people who are not begging on the street, who are just leading normal lives. They look like they're productive. They look like they're functional, and like everything, you know, they seem to be okay, but they're poor. And they just kind of go up to them and go, here's $1,000. We are never giving you money again. This is a one-time grant. And then they walk away. And then you come back a year later, not to give them money, but to see what they spent the money on. And they'll spend the money on things that are really useful to them. And things that they, like a person like me wouldn't have predicted, like putting a metal roof on a thatch house. And it turns out that reduces malaria. Like, who knew? So I'm, I think a lot of charity can be good like that. And the critique of foreign aid, the government to govern foreign aid, doesn't necessarily apply to private charity uh, because it has a different kind of incentive structure. Because you're giving money directly to, you can be giving money directly to people who are suffering rather than using extractive corrupt governments as an intermediary. Hi, hi. so my question is, um, so obviously there's lots of business opportunities out there for people you know, like me and such, but once you have you know, $10 billion or something, your um, rate of return, you, know, you can't find the best business opportunity because you have to find one that can take the amount of money you currently have. So does the, should, due to that reasoning, does it become, you know, you get, have less marginal utility from the wealthier you are from investing your wealth, um, just less beneficial to society because you can't point, pinpoint it to where it's needed most. So does um, the, uh, if that's the case, does the, um, should the most wealthy people, as their investment returns decrease, in that, um, give more to charity? The good ones. Uh, I mean, maybe, but it might just call for better investing. I mean, if you really wanted to, if you really wanted to maximize your, the way you help other people, you would just say, well, do whatever maximizes the benefit to others, and it's going to be a puzzle what that is. Um, you know, because I mean, even on the diminishing marginal returns issue, it's also the case that like consuming it has sharply diminishing returns. You know, investing it has diminishing returns. I mean, a lot of wealthy people, they're just going to throw their money into various accounts and they'll try to like make more, but they recognize they're never going to really eat this money. It's going to be, and so you're, you know, it's a good question. Like, does it turn out when people get to be a certain level of wealth, they start becoming worse at investing? You know, that's an interesting hypothesis. I honestly, I don't know whether it's true, right? I think that's a really good question. I think that's like, if, if you're in one of my classes, I'd be like, you should sign up for a summer research fellowship and like do that as like, or, or like you should get like a seat, write a senior thesis on that question. Cause like when you say it, it's like, it's intriguing, it's plausibly true. And I don't know if it's true or not. And if it were true, what would it mean? You know, um, on the other hand, like, I don't think like, I don't, I don't think we have to maximize the good that we do. I think we should do some good, but we don't have to maximize it. So I wouldn't say like, in order for you to justify having money, you have to maximize the output you do with it. And one reason I don't say that is because if I said that about billionaires, I'd have to say that about us, and none of us are doing it either. Right? It's really easy to point to the billionaires and go, you guys aren't maximizing the good that you do, but I guarantee you no one in here is either. Right now, we could all be like, saving people from blindness. So like, I'm, you know, no offense to me or you, but I think we can do better things. Than that. Yeah, so that's why. But great question. I hope you write a paper on that someday. Thank you. So lawyers don't produce anything specific. So I was wondering, what do you think about their economic value? 
What's their economic <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. What, I mean, again, it's going to vary from lawyer to lawyer. Uh, but you don't have to produce anything specific to have value, right? Like, what, do you what does it even count as producing? Like, do you have to build something? Do you have to, like, grow something from the ground? Do you have to extract something from the dirt? Do you have to make a thing? Uh, you know, think about, like, teachers. Teachers do a lot of talking, and people nod their heads and then they write stuff down, and maybe that's doing good in the future, but it's not like building something. So what do lawyers do? They do things like, uh, imagine, imagine I write a book called Cracks in the Ivory Tower, The Moral Mess of educate, Higher Education, and in it, I give a lot of examples of how universities violate business ethics, and being bold and strident as I am, I go so far as to include my own employer, Georgetown University, as one of the groups that does bad things which I, in fact, did. Uh, so then, uh, having done that, imagine that, contrary to fact, that the university president gets really mad at me and tries to get me fired, right? Well, according to my contract, I can't get fired for saying that, and so it's like I have academic free speech that includes the right to criticize the university and the president, even if I'm wrong. I can't engage in libel, but I can make the kind of arguments I make, right? Now I'm like, oh no, I've just lost my job and I want to like sue the university to like get compensation for like the future income that they owe me, which I definitely, or am I still on camera? Which I definitely would do. <laughs> I would do it the day I got fired. I would, I would actually knock on and go straight to a law office and like sue you guys immediately. All right. I want to, like, I'm owed compensation, but I don't know how to get that stuff on my own. I need a lawyer for that. And there's a million other stories like that where lawyers can like help people. They're serving, they're, like the law is complicated and unwieldy and they provide advice about how to do it. They provide services that you can't do for, you can represent yourself in court, but you ever hear the phrase like only a fool represents himself in court or, or no sorry, a person who represents in court, himself in court has a fool for a client, right? Because most of us are terrible at it. We get emotional and so on. Lawyers can do all sorts of good for us. Uh, that doesn't mean all of them do, but a lot of them do. Right. So yeah, I, I, we can talk about criminal lawyers, what they do. We can talk about prosecutors, what they do. We can talk about marriage lawyers, what they do. They're, they're doing all sorts of stuff to help us navigate. In a way, like just to have a simple thing, imagine there's a labyrinth and people get stuck in it sometimes. And there are people who are good at helping people get out of that maze. Well, now the labyrinth is the law and the people get them out, of, out of the maze for lawyers. Now, that said, we can also complain a lot about lawyers too. Because sometimes what the lawyers do is make the, the thing complicated on purpose in order to make you need them. That's rent seeking. But... You know, some of it's good. Right. Yeah, good question. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so when you say the English department, it says makes it. Uh, by makes it, uh, the other alternative beside making it is not making it. Uh, so I guess I'm just asking a part on the necessity of the English department. If you're saying it's not a necessity, and I've, it's not like a challenge in any way at all. It's just more so the idea like with pollution, uh, the idea of in order to be competitive, you have to pollute. Uh, so you can make the same argument uh, talking about how they essentially have to be making it through polluting. And we're trying to stop, find solutions for not polluting. So I just wanted to kind of get your gauge on that. Just yeah. Thank you for asking more about, you know, I, I did it as an offhand, but then I used as a real example, and now we're talking more about it. I'm glad to. I'm glad to make fun of English departments. Uh, you know, it's one thing if, like, like everything we do pollutes. Uh, if you recycle, if you decide to recycle aluminum cans, recycling is an industrial process that creates pollution, right? Everything pollutes. Uh, so it's true that, like, if you're going to do something that we need, there's going to be pollution, and there's a question we can ask about, is this thing, making this thing worth the pollution that we have? If you decide to take a, you know, we can ask that. But then what if it's something that we don't need at all or something that's not actually very good for you? Well, then probably the best thing is to just not make it and certainly not to force you to make it or take it, right? So uh, some people might say things like, Brennan, you know, you have this complaint about gen ed classes, like, you know, like composition classes and foreign language classes, and you say they don't work. Just to be clear, I do, I do actually accept the idea that, like, if you graduate with a bachelor's degree, you should know a lot. You should know one thing a lot, but you should know a lot of stuff. I think you should know something about science. You should know how to speak a foreign language decently. You should know things about like understanding other cultures. You should know the history of the planet and different cultures and groups. You should know, I, I think you should all know all that stuff. 
but I'm not really very strongly in favor of making people take classes in it. And the reason is because empirically speaking, over and over again, we make people take classes and they don't actually learn it. So some people, what do you want to do instead? I'm like, take whatever classes you want. Right. I didn't realize, I used to work for a school, not my current school, which has lots of gen eds, but the school I worked at before had no gen ed requirements. You had to major in something, you had to take like 30 classes and you had to major in something. Uh, and you could design your own major pretty easily. And that was it. So if you want to take 32 classes in Chinese, great, you could do that. And at the time I was like, this is nonsense. And then I read all this stuff about educational psychology and went, oh wow, they're right. Yeah, so basically, in a way if you're like, the English department, I think it's the pollution it makes is not worth it. That would, and I would say that about pretty much, pretty much any department. Like uh, when people are like, do you think people should be required to take classes in your department? I'm like, no, right? I mean, I'm glad some people take them, but I don't like vote in favor of them. Like when I was on the gen ed committee at my own school, I would like try to make it as open ended as possible, because even though I think people should know this much, forcing to take classes in it isn't doing the trick. And if it isn't, then we have to think about an alternative model of education. Um, instead, what happens at most schools is people are, most universities have a lot of fighting for resources, and one of the resources is our, your tuition dollars. And if you take, if, I don't know what it's like here, but in most schools you take a class with me, my department gets more money, we'd rather have more money than less. If we can't attract you to our classes through other means, we force you to take them, which is just on par with, uh, does anyone here have uh, Coca-Cola? Like, not Diet Coke, but regular Coke? All right, there you go. That has corn sugar, corn syrup in it, not sugar. Do you guys know why? Anyone? It's cheaper. Do you know why it's cheaper? Yeah. Because of tariffs. Because of tariffs. Because companies like ADM and others go to uh, the government in, in D.C. and say, hey, what if you force Americans to pay extra money on sugar imported from elsewhere? And also, by the way, just tax them and just give us money. And then when it happens, corn syrup will be artificially cheap. All of the economists say that that's terrible. They all say that that creates more harm than good. What do you think? And the government's like, sure. So that's why there's, that's why there's corn syrup in your Coke. Right? That's called rent seeking. That's a prime instance of it. Lots of people do that. So when I say like, does Coke, is Coke bad or good? I'm like, well, Coke, some of the money it has, it deserves. And some of the money it has, it doesn't deserve. Well, actually Coke is the victim here. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be blaming them. Some of the money that Archer Daniels Midland has, it deserves. And some of the money that Archer Daniels Midland has, it doesn't deserve. It kind of depends on the mix of how it got it, right? The, the stuff that comes from rent seeking is bad. The stuff that comes from elsewhere is okay. Yeah, so thank you, good question. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Yathrib. I'm a PhD in health economics. At the beginning, I will thank you for this amazing session. It actually brings a lot of thoughts that come to me while you were, get, we were presenting it. Yeah. First of all, we were talking about economy, and it's all about supply and demand, and about having a value. And money, we need money to be happy. So if you get all of this money, just putting it in our pockets, without actually spreading it to others or helping others, what is the value that you are getting? The value is not just something monetary funds, it can be incentivized, such as like, you will maximize the, uh, the satisfaction level. Especially, you said, maybe after 15,000 a year, you will get to the satisfaction plateau. So even if you get more and more, you will still have the, feel the same feeling. But if we, do if we done this investment in growth, and we bought it in some charity level, we will get investment in different levels. At the beginning, we'll be tax-free. Secondly, we will be happy, because others are happy. Uh, also, we do believe in good deeds, actually replicate good deeds. And at the end, on the long run, we will have a better place to live with less money to give back and we'll become rich because we won't find a lot of criminals, we won't find a lot of orphans outside, we won't find a lot of bad things happening. So it's all about win-win situation. And you mentioned that in the candy game, that just by trading it, we all become happy. So why do you think like sometimes I felt that maybe I got it wrong. When are we pouring from our full, like full cup, it will actually uh, make us empty. Yeah. We are always full by not only money, by morals, by happiness, by all of this. And why not investment in growth versus charity? What about investment in growth versus spending? What about like minimizing the spending in something that don't have a value? Yeah. I'm just sharing this. No, I agree. Uh, I think the difference between you, if we sat down and talked this out, we're going to be just debating a lot of the particulars, but not the basic idea, right? In a way, uh, I teach a whole class that's on effective altruism, and we spend a lot of time talking about charity is great, but most of them aren't. In, in principle, it's good. A lot of them aren't, uh, aren't good charities. So, you know, it's like 
it's not charity is good. It's good charities are good and bad charities are bad. It's not that spending is good. It's good spending is good, bad spending is bad, and we can kind of tell the difference. Um, in a way, like, this is a defensive money, but it's not really defensive money. This stuff, you know, this has no real intrinsic value. I don't particularly need a picture of Grant. I don't, it doesn't smell that great. Like, I don't like the, I don't like the feel of this in my fingers, you know? It's probably pretty, this one's pretty new, but probably this stuff's pretty dirty, right? Money kind of sucks, but in itself, but what's good about it is what we can do with it, right? So, you know, as the Marxist philosopher Jerry Cohen said, this is, a, this is freedom. It's a ticket to do what you want. And so what I'm basically saying is like, with the first set of slides is like, as a matter of fact, empirically speaking, these tickets do a lot for us. They make us happier, but it's not all they do. They let us read and stuff. And I want to say, by the way, the diminishing returns on happiness, I don't think it plateaus at $15,000. I think it's just, I don't, it's not like up to 15 and then nothing. It's just diminishing returns. And we don't get less happy and less happy. Happiness isn't everything either, right? Uh, and I think you'd agree. Let me give you an example of things that don't make you happy. Sorry, guys, but you're in the front. Children, <laughs> empirically speaking, I have two kids, by the way, and I had them on purpose after I knew about this research. Empirically speaking, people are not made happier by their children. A typically, for a typical person who's identical to you, demographically has the same income and stuff like that, same job, you probably would be happy, that person's happier than you without children until maybe about age 85 or so, and then they tend to be a bit happy for having had kids. So I wouldn't say, like, having children for the purpose of being happier is like taking an international flight for the purpose of getting a meal, right? It's not the point, but it's meaningful. Right? So I think when I talk about the happiness stuff, I'm not saying it all cashes out and money makes us happier, keeps making us happier. It's like, no, there's diminishing returns, but it does a lot of other stuff. So it turns out that like, families that make a lot of money, even when you control for things like the fact that the, you're more conscientious might make you make more money and be a better marriage partner, it's just money itself protects you from so much downsides that you're more likely to have a good marriage, which isn't just about happiness, it's about it itself. You're more likely to have leisure to be able to pursue higher level art and stuff like that. So I think the point about diminishing returns on happiness is important, but it's also not all about happiness, it's about other stuff. Now we, can, now we can just start talking about what's the optimal mix of investing versus trading versus consumption versus chari like the good charities, not the bad charities. So my last question, thank you so much for this clarification. My last question will be like, do you recommend in order to be rich just to invest in growth versus charity or just to have this balance between like growth and charity giving? I honestly, when I say this is a genuine- the personal level. Yeah, good question. When I say this is a genuine puzzle, like what's the optimal mix? I, I'm not being cute. I actually think it's a genuine puzzle. You know, I don't really know how much I should give to charity. I don't really know the right. I mean, I invest, I probably put 20% away per year um, towards retirement and so on. Um, when I'm at 21, 20, somewhere around about 20, 21%, I'm guessing. Is that the optimal level? Is it, should it really be 15 or 27? I don't know for sure. You know, the amount that I give to charity, should it be more or less? I'm not really sure. Uh, the amount that I consume should be more or less, probably not more, probably about, probably about the right amount. I don't think it would do much more for me. But I honestly don't think that there's a really good formula. I think it's, it's a genuinely hard question and we can't come up with a, like an algorithm to solve it even on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I think we just have to look and go, man, the world is mean to us because it tells us that there are these big trade-offs and then it doesn't tell us how to solve them. Um, yeah, like that's true. We can't solve this question, but at the same time, this question, if we didn't solve it, it will bring us that just investing in growth without investing in charity or other good deeds will make us selfish and greedy. And that's why some people will felt, oh, if I get rich, I will, be, I will be so much spoiled to the extent that I don't know what's happening around me. Yeah. That's why we don't feel okay. So if we didn't solve this puzzle, I don't know where it will go. <laughs> yeah, and just to be clear, I'm not saying don't give to charity, right? I'm not saying, ah, you don't have to give anything to charity. I'm just, I'm like responding to the people that are like, you better give it all away. All, like you should be, like Peter Singer's official view is, it, you should be giving to the point where if you try to give more, they'd have to look and go, you know what, we should give some back to you because you're worse off than we are. <laughs> he doesn't actually live this way, by the way. You know, he says he gives away, he gives away a lot to charity, but he says he gives away about 20 to 25% to charity. He's a full professor at Princeton. He sells a lot of books. He probably makes half a million dollars a year. If he gives away 25% of his income, he's still one of the richest Americans alive right? Uh, that's what I'm responding to. So I'm not here to say never give to charity, like give to give directly, give to site savers, they're great. It's instead, should you feel guilty if you have any extra, right? And I think no, and because we all have extra, by the way.
Any? Last question over here, Saizo. <clears throat> hey, thanks so much uh, for the presentation. Um, I have some great friends, and they like to rage <clears throat> against capitalism. Yeah. Probably we're English majors. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to go to business school, and one time I was forced to read How Nations Fail, and so I try to explain this concept of economic institutions. Not very good at it. Um, how can I help my friends understand the benefits of these economic institutions like trade and investment? Um, because sometimes they do bring, bring up great points about large societal issues that are, that are not solved yet and probably should be solved by now, maybe. Um, so how do I help my friends understand uh, how lucky we are to have these economic institutions? Yeah, I mean, assuming they're open to listening, which they might not be. Uh, <laughs> you know, most of my research is on this very point, like political psychology and how people respond to arguments. So they might not be open, but if they are open, uh, you know, it takes a while, but at the end of the day, you have to kind of just show them the stats. Like when you ask me, why are some nations rich and others poor? The typical person thinks some nations had great resources, others don't. But economics says that's not true. There's a resource curse. The countries that tend to be richer are the ones with worth, worse resources, surprisingly. We have a story behind that. You know, you can point to examples like, you know, the USA was, was richer than the USSR during the Cold War, but the USSR has way better resources. Hong Kong was richer than mainland China, but Hong Kong's a bunch of rocks and mainland China has amazing resources. Singapore's rich and has no resources, et cetera. And if you give them enough cases like that over time, they make go, okay, maybe there's something to it. If you say it's about imperialism and, and slavery, you can tell them this story and go, actually, imperialism and slavery are really bad. They're not economically efficient, and here's how we know. Okay, but I don't think they're going to be persuaded by that, because for a lot of people, they really, really want to believe that capitalism's wealth comes from slavery. Because they, not because, because they don't really care about slavery, because they hate capitalism, they want an excuse to hate it. Right? That's where they're coming from ideologically. Uh, so they're not going to be dissuaded. But then you have to tell them, well, what's the positive story that economists believe? And the most common view is the institutional theory that says, Look, countries that have certain institutions, all of them who have it are rich, and those that don't are poor. And we can show over time when they move towards having these institutions, they get richer. When they move away from them, they get poorer. But now you have to sort of show them econ papers that measure this stuff and look at change over time. And uh, man, if you got someone, an English major who's like willing to follow you that far and look at all these stats, like they're probably not an English major anymore, you know? <laughs> right? So it's like, it's hard. Uh, you know, if they take a class with me, we cover all this. And, they learn, it's like, they, they can see it and they go, oh yeah, I get it. But uh, if I were at a bar with somebody who's, an, who's like, yeah, Marx is right, I'd be like, I don't think I could convert them in 10 minutes. <laughs> like, right? It's just, it's too much of a challenge. But, but yeah, that's, that's what I try to do. Is this on YouTube or? This, we're here? Yeah. Is it going to be on YouTube? It'll be recorded to be at the Center for Free Enterprise website in about a week. Yeah. I'll yeah, that. that's great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I want to thank Jason for a great talk. A little gift from the All center. Right, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.